I was trying to read what's in your library, Derek, and I can't quite read it. Chairman, it's Helen Snell. I can confirm that we are now live. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this meeting of the uh, Local Government Pension Scheme for Formal Pension Committee. And um, my name is Derek Holly. I'm the chairman, and I've got a statement to read first of all. Welcome to this meeting. Before consideration of today's business, I will outline the protocols for the meeting. Today's meeting is being live streamed to the public via Microsoft Teams and is also being recorded. When members are speaking, they may choose to use their video. That will be a good idea, please, members. And don't forget to turn them off. If the council's live stream fails during the meeting, and we cannot share the proceedings. I will adjourn the meeting so that access can be restored. If we can't do that, I will halt the meeting and the remaining business will be concluded at a future date. If a member experiences a technical issue and they can't resolve it, I will adjourn for a short period to try to re-establish the connection. As I, cause, as I call members to speak, I'll remind you to switch on your microphone. If for some reason you cannot be heard, the democratic officer will advise you. The vote will be taken by using the raise your hand function. Um, the vote will be taken by a roll call and the result will be announced by the Democratic Services Officer. Should the press and public be excluded from the meeting, members will be required in turn to confirm and declare there are no other persons present who are not entitled to see or hear consideration of the matter. When the member has declared a non-registrable interest, a disclosable interest, pecuniary, or an interest by virtue of any trade union membership in the matter, in the matter they must leave the virtual meeting. The departure will be confirmed and they'll be invited to rejoin the meeting at the appropriate time. To confirm the procedure for today's meeting is that the members of the committee who wish to speak in item should indicate by using the raise your hand function, which is being monitored by the vice chairman. Any members not on the pensions committee or unable to use the hand raise your hand function who wish to ask a question, please type an X in the chat box. And that's the end of announcements and democratic services officer. Is that going to be Helen? That's or me, Rowena. It's Rowena Bradner, Chairman. Yes. OK, thank you. Um, I will now call your name. Please confirm your name and your electoral division. And whether you are representative of other employers or a member nominated representative. Councillor Holly. Uh, Derek Holly, Saltash East Division. Councillor Mitchell. Pete Mitchell, St Agnes Division. Councillor Fitter, I believe, is attending later on in the meeting. Councillor Harris. David Harris, Truro to have in the vision. Councillor Hurd. John Hurd, Cambrian Pendorvis Division. Councillor James. Sue James, St Justin Penwith Division. Councillor Kenny. Good morning, Joanna Kenny, Newquay Pentire. Councillor Kirkham is attending later as well. Councillor Monk. Hi, Councillor Monk, New Teacher Logan. Councillor Wood. Councillor Wood, Roach. And Andy Stott. Andy Stott, member nominated representative. We also have the following people in attendance. From the Pensions Board, we have Katie Dalsgaard. Um, advisors, we have Robbie Sinnott, Kieran Harkin, Annika Baduri, John Finch. Actuaries, we have Catherine McFadden and Judy West. Um, we also have Chris Crazier, Investment Manager from Brunel, and officers from Cornwall Council. We have Russell Ashman, Sean Johns, Matt Chapman, Teresa Elkington, Melissa Kelly, Matt Davis, Matt Allen, James Paul, and myself, Rowena Brebner, Democratic Officer. Lovely. Thank you very much, Rowena. Uh, first of all, then, welcome to the meeting. Uh, welcome to all those people who have virtually come a long way. It's lovely to see you all. Um, the longest distances from Glasgow, I think. I think that's um, from uh, our actuaries. And th thank you for your attendance. Apologies for absence, Madam Secretary. We have apologies from Chris Wilson and Nick Olgard. Thank you very much. Are there any declarations of interest? No. 
Minutes of the meetings. Um, there have been two meetings on the 10th of December, a public one and a private one, and we don't discuss the minutes in, in these meetings. So I, could someone please, or well, I'll nominate from the chair, that these be approved. Have a second, please. I'll um, second, Derek. Thank you, John. That was, who was that? Was that? Andy Stott. Uh, Andy, thank you. I'm sorry to recognise your voice. Um, all those in favour, please. Um, I'll, do, I'll do a roll call, Chairman. Councillor Holly. Yes. Four. Councillor Mitchell. Four. Councillor um, Councillor Fitz is not here. Councillor Harris. Four. Councillor Hurd. Four. Councillor James. Four. Councillor Kenny. Four. Councillor Kirkham isn't here yet. Um, Councillor Monk. Four. Councillor Wood. Abstain. And Andy Stott. Four. Thank you. That's carried, Chairman. Thank you very much. Um, we go on to item number four on page 13, which is the business plan. And Sean, can you take us through this, please? And if you could, please, in particular, Sean, draw notice to um, that list of extraneous inferences I talked to you about. And uh, over to you, Sean. Thank you. Yeah, sure thing. Thanks, Derek. Um, so the business plan basically details the priorities and the key areas of focus of the fund and um, we do it as a three year document, but we review it and update it and publish a new version every year. We also issue a mid year review part way through of the work plan um, and if there's any kind of extraneous activities which we didn't envisage that require any significant impact to the budget, we bring them to the committee meeting as well. Um, just before I briefly walk people through the additions to the work plan this year and um, if I could just turn people to page 27 please um, and that's just the, the the list of kind of extraneous items which Derek referred to so obviously on top of all, all, all the normal pieces of work and all the changes we've been aware of that are happening for some time uh, there, there also seems to be a, a lot of new activities coming and um, that we need to um, do in the next couple of years as well um, and these are just detailed on the page. So there's quite a few in terms of both admin and investments, um, but I, I, I'll leave them for people to read at their leisure. And um, if I could now just turn people on to page 36 of the pack, I'll just quickly run through some of the new, new additions to this year. And um, so Gov8 is implementing the outcomes of the Good Governance Project. Um, there's been an update to that in the last couple of weeks and in the governance paper um, Catherine from Hymans will just be giving a quick high level update um, of what's been going on on the project. So um, that's we'll still be waiting to go to MHCLG to get guidance published, but that's something that we envisage and there'll be some work on in the next few years. We already meet a lot of the requirements, but obviously, you know, in any kind of review of this, there'll be areas which we need to um, further strengthen as well the rest of the LGPS. Um, governance 11 is another one I wanted to point people to. So this is an annual employer health check. This is a new process we've been starting to work on the last few months. And what that will be doing is um, two things. The first, it will be doing an annual review of the employers on a risk basis. So um, all those which are a higher risk, what we'll be doing is we'll be reviewing their financial statements and putting that through some KPIs um, to see whether we think there's any risk that the pension fund may not receive the money it's due. Once we've done that kind of first stage for the ones that we do have um, some concerns on, we will be doing a second stage, which is a kind of a, a KPI on a revenue basis to see how affordable the contributions are as a revenue. So that's just trying to build out the kind of the risk management approach we have in managing the um, employers of the fund. Um, if I could move people on to page 43, please. Um, this is to just go through a couple of the responsible investment bits. Um, I won't touch on them in too much detail here because I'll give an update when we go through the responsible investment section of the investment paper, but um, RI4 um, through to eight are all new ones added this year. So there'll be a 
there'd be a, a plan of work to kind of make the fun align to the 2020 stewardship code, which you know re requires a significant amount of work, I would say, for, for anybody attempting to be compliant with that. Uh, we'll be reviewing the RI policy later in the year. Um, part of that will be the scheme member engagement where we're going to look to write out to the members of the pension scheme and get their views on the funds approach to responsible investment and feed that into the review. Um, we'll also be producing a TCFD report, which is a task force on climate related development. Um, and that will just be evidencing how the fund approaches climate change from a strategic um, overview position. And then there's the IIGC C net zero framework, which I'll cover a little later as well. So um, you can see that you know, there is on top of the usual bits we do um, and excluding anything which comes out last minute, there is a, a lot of additional things on the work plan this year. Um, before I move on to the cash flow and operating budgets, um, did anyone have any questions on the work plan? No, just to say, Sean, this is the first time that we will have done scheme member engagement on the responsible investments, and uh, it's quite an important step for us and the members. Excuse me, Derek, uh, John Hurd's got a question. John? Yeah, I'd like to go back to page 34 mm -hmm. and administration and communication. Main risks, the service delivery might not meet legal requirements. Could you explain that to me? Yeah, sure thing. Um, what this is doing is this is just giving a kind of a generalised overview of each of the different areas of risk. And that section is basically saying, you know, what is the worst risk that could happen um, and what could change that risk? It's not something that we're in a position that we have, um, but this is just saying like, what's the worst risk? And then our risk management policy and our risk register then go into a lot more detail on these. So yeah, I, mean, I think it, the it, point, a point that John's making, which is a good point, that there may not have been sort of expressed in a way that uh, is conducive for the public to understand that. They may take this view which John has that, oh, hang on, we're doing something that's wrong here. Okay, um, just a I'm couple a of paragraphs. <laughs> oh, sorry, I was going to say just a couple of paragraphs further down. Um, there's yeah. one that says current risk, and that details what the current risk is, which um, states that the governance review concluded the administration communication was of a high standard. So, I mean, if you want, we can try and relook at that if there's a better way of um, well, ordering it. I don't think it. it's worth doing now, but it's a point for the future perhaps. But okay, John. Yes. yes sir. Excuse me, Derek. Sue James. Sue? Yeah, thank you. Um, not sure whether now's the appropriate time for me to speak or whether I should have been doing it later, but I might as well now. I've got the uh, attention. Um, what it is, is I mean, speaking as a committee member who, you know, was on the committee, was away for a while and then back, um, I, I am really pleased that we have uh, embraced and moved forward on our RI and climate change uh, policies. And I think uh, more than ever before, I mean, I think pensions committee is something that probably had very little public attention, whereas now probably up and down the country, not just in Cornwall because of the climate change issue, uh, it's much more attention. Um, I'm glad about the scheme member engagement. I think that's something that's uh, that's wanted. But my, my question is, given all that positive work and how that's reflected in this plan, um, it may be that, that in the past we've not done a lot to publicise the fact that we've got a business plan and it's being published, whereas I think we ought to because I certainly as a councillor, and I'm sure other councillors get this, I get lots of emails from people who are very concerned about the environment and what we're doing with our investments and, and, and uh, policies in relation to the climate emergency. And I think they would be interested to see it and we should, you know, I'm not saying we've got, we're, we're perfect and we're, we've done all we need to do, but I think we've made a lot of progress and we should be letting people know about that. So what are we going to do to make sure that, if you like, that it's a bit more of a fanfare about us having it. It doesn't just go on the website. 
Yeah, sure thing, Sue. Um, you, you've actually quite nicely segued me into a, a, an item I was going to bring up later um, in that we've got a press release going out today because we were one of the first signatories to the net zero investor framework which launched yesterday. Um, so I'll, I'll probably touch on that in a bit more detail later on. But I, I agree, I think it's a very important point and one of the, because we've been drafting the questionnaire, um, one of the areas of that is how do members actually engage with the scheme and what's the best way of communicating? Because one, one of the issues we've come across with um, looking at when we're trying to launch this member engagement survey is obviously we don't want to um, do this by mail shot and send out 50,000 packs um, all taking up lots of paper because it's probably kind of counterintuitive. So we're, we're trying to find and use more modern methods of communication, um, but also just being cognizant that not all of the members you know, um, will be using electronic formats. So that's one of the, sorry, that was as polite as I could put it. <laughs> um, yeah, that's one of the things we're going to try and get from the survey, because I agree with you, it's important we communicate these things, but we need to make sure we do it in the right way. Yeah, thanks, so it's a really good point. Maybe in the past we have been reactive to these things and we must be more proactive. Yeah, thank you. OK, Sean, back to you. Yep, um, thank you. Um, if I could turn members to page 29. Um, so the next couple of pages uh, set out the cash flow and further down on page 30, it's more the um, operating budget for the pension fund. I mean, I'll open it up to questions in a second, but I think the only item that I really wanted to point out was in terms of the um, what's labelled services purchased internally, which is basically all the costs of the admin and the investment teams. So that's the cost of the staff and it's also the kind of the underlying expenses. The one thing I wanted to point out is that what's been proposed is an increased budget um, for three new pensions <coughs> admin staff um, and, and that's kind of detailed at the bottom and what that is to do with is that's to kind of assist with all the extra administration work which has come from all these new regulations and all the ones we've seen in the future and also you know, the, the massive resource impact in the cloud um, and what the admin team did was they had Hyman's kind of run an analysis that they're doing for a lot of pension funds as to how much work in terms of FTEs, the McLeod will take up. And um, so that's what that assumption has been based on. We did a comparison to the SIP for benchmarking on the um, fund staffing costs with the increased member of staff and, you know, even excluding anybody, other funds increasing their costs will still be below the average cost of the schemes as well with this. David's got a question. David? Sorry, thank you. Um, yeah, so just a couple of questions on on, on, on the on these numbers. Mm -hmm. um, the fund management fees, the 2021 estimate was two million. The revised estimate is two and a half million. Mm -hmm. So why is that suddenly bumped up like that? I mean, it, it falls back. And then just moving on, the next line, the Brunel service charge. I, mean, I presume that's the Brunel fees. And logically, you would think as we got more assets into Brunel, those fees would go up. So, that's, so I presume that's good news, that's showing the benefit of Brunel in terms of cost saving, but I would not mind it having been confirmed. And then when we look at our costs on, you, you said the pensions admin figures include the extra staff, but looking at strategy and investments, um, there our estimate for 20, 2021 was 385,000, the revised estimate is 300,000. Is there some sort of relationship between that question and the fund management fees? Okay. I'll do my best to remember all the questions you've asked, David, but you may have to remind me if I forgot one of them. Um, in terms of the fund manager fees, these are fund manager fees which are paid at a cash in hand, um, not the ones where we pay through deduction of units. The reason that the revised estimate is different is because the transition across the Brunel has taken a bit longer than envisaged, um, partly due to the delays in COVID caused by COVID, where there was over a six month pause in transitions. So some of its timing, the other difference as well is one of the investment mandates, which is quite sizable, which is our risk management framework. Um, when we originally put the budget together, we thought it was going to operate in a different way than it did. Um, 
but Brunel kind of listened to us and put together a portfolio which is individual to each of the funds. So the cost of that is actually coming out of our cash at hand, whereas we thought it was going to be coming out of the kind of the Brunel um, asset charges, which are what we see in the annual report. In terms of the Brunel service charge, that has fallen. Um, that isn't the charge for the assets which Brunel manage. That's our contribution to Brunel, the company, um, and their different cost base, so, you know, their staffing, etc. Um, I think some of it is partly lower because Brunel have been managing the costs a little bit more uh, around COVID. So there's been a slight reduction there. Um, and I think some of it is also due to the forecast of the custodian fees because um, as the assets transition, they'll be managed by the custodian in a slightly different way, which is why you know there was a little bit of a dip in there. Um, in terms of the strategy and investments, the reason that is 300 is mainly because um, the additional staffing which we're coming into the investments team has been incredibly delayed um, due to COVID. So whereas I was expecting another one and a half FTEs um, early on in last year, what actually happened is one of them started in January this year and the half FTE isn't starting until May next year. Some of the other differences are due to um, things we've not spent on because of COVID like travel costs. So for example, myself and Russell haven't had to go to London all year because we've done everything by teams. I think that was all your questions. Yeah, can I just be clear on something? It, 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 would, it certainly confused me. Mm -hmm. This, of course, is a cash flow forecast. So your point on fund management fees is easier to fund management fees paid out of cash rather than out of asset accounts. So anybody looking would think that was the total of our fund management fees. And in fact, it isn't. We should have to ex explain that more clearly. And the Brunel service charge, that, so that's our contribution to Brunel's running costs. Not cheap. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. I. I mean, I can. I can certainly look at trying to make the note more prominent for the fund manager fees. It's just it's not one that we can include in this because the one we do in the annual report has a lot of, um, you know, kind of below the line costs. So it's much more detailed and very difficult to estimate. Yeah. No, thank Andy, you, Andy. Please, chair. I'm sorry. Sorry, David. Can you just confirm on that one, Sean, to answer David Fotley. That includes the custodian charges. If mm -hmm. we're still doing this all ourselves, we would still have to pay substantial custodian charges anyway of our yeah. own. So that that is just transferred over and that's part of it. OK, thank you. And then who is the question from? Was it? Was it Andrew? Andy? Andy. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, on page 29, the uh, cash flow forecast table mm -hmm. shows a, uh, a worrying. Well, we, we were aware, aware of it, which is there's uh, an estimated increase of three million in income, but at the same over the same period, a seven million increase in liabilities or expenditure. You know, it seems to show the predicted uh, drift to becoming cash negative. Obviously, a major issue for the next valuation. I would have thought. Uh, I don't know. If there's anybody wants to comment any further? Um, I suppose all, all I'll say, Andy, is yeah, I mean, as, as we become a more maturing scheme, it isn't something which comes as a surprise. I mean, as you know, we've um, started doing a more detailed cash flow analysis on this annually. Um, so, yeah, it's something we're definitely keeping an eye on. Um, and obviously, the, the kind of levels we can use to react to that are a change in investment strategy to make it more income generating. Thank you. Yeah. Keep going in, Sean. Yeah. Um, if there's no further questions on the budget, then um, could I just quickly turn people to page 54, please? Um, this is just the work plan outturn for last year. Um, so there's only a few items which haven't been done. Um, if, excuse me, I'm still trying to find the page on mine. Yeah, so there are a, a few items which haven't been completed, and those are the ones which aren't covered in um, just for ease. So go to review the audit plan that would normally come to this committee meeting. That's been delayed nationally um, due to the backlog from last year and um, that the audit we're facing because of COVID reasons. So that's something which will 
well, what we'll have to put in the next committee papers because there'll be a, a, a change in the committee membership, uh, but we would have sent it out by email. Governance three, the review of the cash management strategy. We've not taken that to this meeting like we normally would. And um, for the reason that some of the changes in the investment strategy review later in the agenda may have an impact on this. So we'll be bringing it to the next meeting. Um, governance eight and 10, they were both related to the good governance review, which was delayed. So they're ones which have just been put on next year's that we'll be looking at next year um, when we get the requirements. Um, and then the final one is on page 66, um, and you don't need to turn to that. And um, that's just the overseas pensioner existence check, which was delayed until next year, um, just because of COVID reasons. And that um, is really all the items which we didn't complete. So unless anybody has any further questions on this business plan, then that's everything I wanted to say. Thank you, Derek. There are no hands up. Can, just con can you confirm for me that the delay to the audit will still be able to get it out by the 31st of July? Is that the deadline for that? Um, I believe the deadline changed yesterday, Derek. Oh. Um, so we, we're still waiting to have the discussion with our auditors, but um, in terms of the pension fund, you know, we'll still be able to turn around our accounts at the normal time. Um, and I'm sure Grant Thornton will do everything on best endeavours to ensure everything's done in time for the deadlines. I'm just trying to tick the box because, as you know, we've got the chairman of audit here, David. <laughs> I'm to make sure it's all OK. There's nothing we can do. Derek, I'll come in there just to say that the, um, in terms of the audit of the accounts, um, the statutory audit of the accounts has been moved from the end of July to the end of September in terms of the, the, the council's accounts and the pension funds accounts. Uh, we were working with Grant Thornton probably for the pension fund accounts to be done earlier in their audit and will hopefully be done before and comfortably before the end of September. But that's in the detailed planning as we speak. And as Sean said, I think there are further um, uh, announcements in the last day or two about timings where we have to submit our accounts as well. So. It's a, it's a moving feast at the moment. Thank you, Russell, for that. Any other questions? If not, then the recommendations on page 13 is two. Um, approves business plan attached as appendix one and the work plan review attached as appendix two. Will someone move that, please? I'm happy to, CJ. Thank you, Thank you Sue. Someone second it, please. I'll second. I thought we were doing by raising hands. Yeah, we'll do that in a second. Oh, no, ah. Uh, I'll no. do a roll call vote, Chairman. No, I'm sorry, could you say that again? I missed that. Chairman, I'll do a roll call vote. I think Councillor Kenny was querying the vote, whether it be by raise of hands, but oh, I, no, I'll do, do a roll call vote. Yeah. I was querying the not a set of nominations and seconding. I thought that was by raising hands, but if you want us to shout, that's fine. Uh, shout out. Did you second that, Joanna? Thank you. Yes, I did. Thank Both you. Ways. Okay, Raina. OK, um, when I call your name, please indicate if you are for, against or abstaining. Councillor Holly. For. Councillor Mitchell. For. Councillor Fitter isn't here yet. Councillor Harris. For. Councillor Hurd. For. Councillor James. For. Councillor Kenny. For. Councillor Kirkham isn't here yet. Councillor Monk. Councillor Monk. We'll come back to him, Councillor Wood. Four. Ca and Andy Stott. Four. Councillor Monk, can you indicate how you wish to vote, please? Wally, are you there? Um, just checking that he's still in the meeting. He's showing his, Councillor Monk, you're on mute. If you can hear, can you please indicate how you wish to vote? Four. Thank you. Um, that's unanimous, Chairman. That's been carried. Thank you very much. Thank you for that. I just want to say thank you to Sean and the team for putting together. And in the pre-meeting, we commented that how clear a business plan it was, and it is. So thank you very much for that, Sean and the team. Okay, over to Russ um, for item number five, which is the business update investments part one. That's page 71. Russ? Yep, thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, if I can take members to the top of page 76. Um, 
to start with, where we have a summary of the investment performance of the fund um, for the period ending the 31st of December 2020. As you will see that in the last quarter between September 2020 and December 2020, investments have now increased. They've, been, they've increased by 4.4%, which is equivalent to £94 million, and are now valued at £2.218 billion. Pounds, and say that's up on the position at the end of September. So the, the investments are still uh, increasing in value. Um, we mentioned in the training earlier that obviously we had the, the, the big dip in markets due to the COVID emergency coming in um, in Q1, stroke the beginning of Q2 last year. Um, but obviously the recovery has, has uh, cut in very quickly and is still continuing. In terms of the investments, is if you look at it against the position at March 2019 when our triannual valuation was done, you can see that actually assets are up by 292 million and 15.2 percent. So a considerable increase in our, our the value of our investments since the valuation was done. In terms of liabilities in the last quarter, these have also increased. They've increased by 68 million, which is equivalent to 3.1 percent. Uh, the net impact of that on the quarter is that our surplus or deficit position has actually uh, um, changed and our deficit has reduced from 81 million down to 55 million, a change of 26 million. So obviously a, a better level of funding as at the end of the quarter. And again, significantly better if you look at the right hand table and you compare it to the 2019 valuation where we were um, still had a deficit of some 207 million and they were now down to a deficit of 55 million so moving in the right direction this is a position as of now as we know the investment world is particularly volatile at the moment and can change it's a good position as we're reporting today probably just worth mentioning as this is the um, last uh, meeting of this committee um, over the period of this administration uh, if you go back to the beginning of the, uh, the administration in 2017, just after the 2016 um, valuation, we were actually sat with a deficit of just slightly under half a billion pounds, 500 million pounds, um, and a funding level of 75%. So in the last four years, we've made significant improvements in our overall funding position and the financial position of the fund. I then just carry on through the report. Before you do uh, that, let's, can I ask a question on that page 76 that, uh, yeah, the, the, the funding level update. Why do we have to, de to de declare uh, Brunel as being uh, over 20%? Because they're not a fund manager on its own, they're just organising the funds for us. So is that part of the FCA requirements? Sean's going to come in here. Uh, yeah, Derek, it's it's not a requirement. It was more just there so that committee were aware of how much of the assets had transitioned to Brunel at this point. You're right, Brunel aren't a fund manager in the sense which we reported on previously. They uh, look after other fund managers for us. But yeah, it, it, it's yep. just on there um, for committee's reference. Thank you. Back to you, Russell. Thank you. OK, so that was my next point that you've already covered, Chair. Um, <laughs> during during the, the quarter, um, we have invested an additional 15 million pounds into the tactical asset allocation portfolio to bring it closer to the strategic allocation of 8% that members approved um, when we approved this, the latest strategic allocation. Um, the portfolio, the property portfolio that was with Aberdeen Standard have now moved across to Brunel and um, although just slightly outside of the quarter we're talking about on the 1st of January, um, the Newton portfolio moved across to Brunel as well. So um, as we covered in the, in the top bit there, 47.8% of the fund has now transitioned to the pool. Um, so we're moving uh, significant proportions of the fund over now. We were always going to be one of the later um, funds to transition because of the timetable that Brunel had, the 
early movers that they moved over were uh, just happened to be in, uh, investment classes that we weren't invested in. But we, you can now see that it is gathering pace and we are now moving significant um, investment sums over to Brunel. OK, on that. Um, sorry, can I just jump in? Sorry, Russell, there's a question for, from David. Uh, sorry, if, if, if Russell wants to finish, I'll come in at the end, sorry. Oh, so, so, OK, go on. OK. Um, sorry, Russell. If I move on to page 77, the uh, top of the table there, there's a performance summary by the various managers that gives the three month, 12 months and three year targets against the, the benchmark targets. Um, I'll pick out a couple of the, 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 the greens and the reds, the larger ones. Yes, some of the uh, Brunel ones are showing um, below target at the moment, but they're mainly because they're relatively new. They've only just been set up. And, and they're not up and running at uh, full pace yet and they're no more than what we would expect at this uh, time. In terms of um, um, one of the more significant uh, under targets for the last three months, you had gone up. Um, you can see at minus 3.6%. Actually, this is nearly all down to um, currency movement. Gollop is based in uh, North America and is in, uh, investment is in dollars. Their actual performance, if you take out of currency, was actually a positive 1.9%. So it's purely down to the currency move um, and the way that that is valued by the custodian that causes um, that minus 3.6%. Um, the other one, the ETF, we have mentioned that so many times. I'm not going to dwell on it, but other than to say that you know, it is a fund that's in the, it, it's a very old fund, it's in its uh, final throes of being wound up, which is why uh, it's as a negative figure. And the other negative one, which I'll touch on, is the risk management framework. Um, that's not a surprise. People may think it's a, you know, it's not good performance. You've got to remember the, the risk management framework in particular at the moment has the equity protection in. So the equity protection is going to go uh, um, slightly different to the way that the equity um, investments go. So with such strong equity uh, um, returns during the last quarter, it's not surprising that the, the risk management framework and equity protection shows a slight um, negative figure. It's nothing that we weren't surprised about. The uh, in terms of positives, there are a couple of quite large positives there. There's the Invesco, um, not, it's got a 9.8% it's uh, head. Um, significantly had really strong performance in the quarter um, and quite a significant element of that is driven by its exposure to commodities and Wiltshire, which is the private uh, equity uh, investment, 10.4%. Uh, as we said previously, the, uh, the private equity and the private debt investments tend to be reported almost a quarter in arrears. Um, so this is probably uh, or is as a direct result of the rebound in the economy post the dip due to COVID. So you had the dip around April, March, April, May last year. Then you had the, the rebound during the summer and this picks up really the position of uh, the quarter running through July to September for Wiltshire. So it's, it's really picked up that rebound. Um, if you further in the report, um, I'm not going to go through it, uh, in, in more, but there is in more detail on page 83. The fuller report is there. Um, it's there for members to read and, and uh, um, absorb in their own time. It includes a market, uh, you know, market commentary and update, but bear in mind that uh, before this meeting we had a, a training session for members where we, you had a market update. So again, I'm not going to dwell on that. There's also more statistics on the voting rights and some more granular uh, details about performance of the fund managers. Again, not going to take you through that. It's there for you to look at, and if you've got questions, we'll answer those. Uh, that, that's my bit on the um, on the performance. Probably the other bit just in here, whether we take questions first or not, is um, Sean's going to come in and give an update on the RI. We take David, you had a question. There? Yeah, and it, it was a, I actually had two, but you've dealt with one of them. When we look at page 76 and we show the figure for investments, is that actually total assets or is it just our investments? 
So at 30, 31, 12, 20, we've got, you say investments are 2218. Mm -hmm. Is that in fact our total assets? I mean, it just what's invested. In other words, does that ignore cash? It includes cash. So, it, so it, in fact, it, it, it's gross gross value of the, of, of the fund. Yeah. Yeah. All right. You can see where I was coming to if it wasn't. Yeah. Um, yeah. OK. Uh, my, other, my other question was about Golan, but you answered that beautifully um, already. And then on page 95, there's a summary of investment commitments. That I, I think we come on to later on, but just to be clear, I mean, we've got some huge commitments to Brunel, but am I right in thinking these are effectively matched by monies coming out of other stuff? Do you want me to say that, Russell? Yeah, you can. Yeah, sure thing. Um, so at the minute, David, we've still got an over allocation um, in the risk management framework and the diversified growth fund where it's going to come from. We do have monies coming back from some of the underlying um, existing ones, you're right, um, but quite a chunk of the money is in those other two investments. Right, okay, thank you. Jo Joanna, please, Chair. Joanna. Thank you, Chair. I'll start with a general comment. I remember the halcyon days of 75 funding level and below. So it is, you know, it's a dramatic improvement over the four years. I congratulate everyone. I seem to remember that two years ago, we'd also had a, a dramatic improvement and we had a discussion about whether we were brilliant or lucky. I decided we were brilliant, but then the COVID came along and I thought perhaps I shouldn't have mentioned that. <laughs> so, but I do congratulate everybody. I think it's really good. Coming on to my favourite subject on page 77, infrastructure, you've got lots of little red dots um, against the infrastructure firms. I assume that is because infrastructure is difficult to difficult to um, uh, to produce uh, an accurate uh, funding position until we get to the end of it. Yeah, there's there's two things to that. I think the first one is the actual benchmark it's measured against isn't an infrastructure benchmark. It's a cash plus benchmark. Um, the second thing is it's. It's as you said, it's timing adjustments. So there was a significant positive um, return, which has now fallen off the three year. Um, in the detailed pack in part two, the mm -hmm. since inception numbers are um, still very good. It, this is just a, you know, because it's not got a since inception figure, it kind of cuts off that long term. It is still very positive. I just thought it was worth mentioning that it's not a proper measure. Great. Thank you. Any more? If it's no, no. If it's no more, sure, we'll just cover the RI element. Before you do, can I just ask one thing about um, Newton, the, the comment you made on page 76, uh, which has moved across to Brunel to sit in their global core uh, portfolio. Is that still the only one in that global core portfolio? It is. Yeah. Because the idea of Brunel was that they would um, put a bit of pressure on the charging schemes, are we getting it cheaper? through Brunel than we were when we had it ourselves? Um, we're getting it for the same, Derek. I think part of the reason is because when we transitioned, we also took away over half the monies to fund the sustainable equities portfolio. Um, and as we're the only investor, so Newton have basically lost half of our investment and haven't got any further investment. So no, the fees, the fees aren't any more competitive, um, but it's still on the same sliding scale it was on prior to it moving over. OK, thank you for that. And the other comment briefly rest is that and Sean. Once again, Wilshire have done the goods for us, haven't they? But we've had them for many, many years and it's only once or twice, I think, when they've been negative. I think it's a superb performance for such a long time, that company. Okay, thanks. OK, then, Sean, over to you for the RI stuff. Uh, yeah, um, if I could just move people onto page 80, please. Um, I know I said I'd cover it more here, but I think I ended up covering most of it in the business plan. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll keep it brief. Um, so this is some of the key RI activities we'll be doing this year. Uh, the task force on climate related financial disclosures, that's something which isn't yet mandatory in the LGPS, but will likely be in a couple of years um, now that it is in the private sector. So as I said earlier, we're going to be publishing a report on that, which is going to be a real look from a strategic top down level as to how the fund incorporates um, responsible investment and climate change. Whereas it's going to be a lengthy initial piece of work doing the document. I'm, I'm pleased to say that you know, we have actually got pretty much all the components in place um, that we're doing ourselves currently. And for the reporting element, Brunel have 
you know, giving us some really groundbreaking and responsible investment reporting in terms of measuring our carbon metrics, etc. So it's one of those time consuming, but it's not stuff we don't already have. And um, the net zero investor framework, there's a press release which should hopefully be going out today that launched um, yesterday. And what that basically does is it equips investors with a, a set of tools to actually be able to construct a net zero investment strategy. So it will help us kind of evaluate from a top down strategic level and kind of a bottom up um, stock level, which Bruno will be doing for us and um, to actually ensure that we get the portfolio climate aligned um, the 1.5 degrees of the Paris Agreement um, by 2050 or earlier. So what we'll be doing later on in the year when we work through the next batch of uh, the responsible investment bits is we'll be kind of factoring this into our updated responsible investment policy. Um, so there'll be a lot more on that in the coming months. The, the scheme member engagement we've touched upon um, and the stewardship code. The only other one is the responsible investment outcomes report. And this is something we do annually now, which just demonstrates the progress we've made in the year. And it also has like positive case studies from either our engagement or Brunel's engagement. So, I mean, going back to um, Sue's earlier points, I think that's another one which um, we probably should publicise a little bit more as that covers a lot of the um, positive things throughout the year in a nice kind of published digestible format. On page 81, just to say that Brunel have recently updated their stewardship policy um, in conjunction with um, the rest of the partnerships, so us as funds and the other nine partners. And what this does is it sets out Brunel's approach to stewardship. The voting guidelines document has been moved into something separate because there's been so much work done on this and it's such a comprehensive document, it was becoming quite um, unmanageable. So that's on the Brunel website and there's a link in the papers for anybody who wants to read up on it. And if anybody ever has any feedback, then please um, pass that on to me and I'll feed it in. Um, and that was all I wanted to touch on in terms of the responsible investment update. There's more detail in the pack, but I'll leave that for people to read at their own leisure. Uh, Andy, please, Joe. And I, I don't know, Joanna, do you want another question or has you answered it from last time? Apologies, that's legacy. Thank you. Yeah, Sean, I was um, on page 80. I know we mentioned this earlier, scheme member engagement. Mm -hmm. It's a it is a very difficult area. Um, how do you reach out to the scheme members? I just wondered if the mechanics of this uh, challenging element have been worked on. You know, what what are the options, the various options? Yeah, sure thing. Um, I mean, I'll give you my overview and I'll let Matt and my team chip in whether or not he has anything further to add. It, it's something that we've been looking at um, over the last month or so, and I think we found various different outlets to do it. This year is the more challenging year because obviously come next year, we'll have member self service in place um, and there'll be more without wanting to take Matt's thunder um, from a his next paper, sorry. Um, we'll have member self-service, so we'll have a database of members' email addresses, but also in the annual benefits statement, which goes out every year, we'll be putting a notification of a link people can register interest to for the following year. Um, so that's how we can more comprehensively capture everybody next year. This year, we've kind of got a few different outlets which we're going to use. So one of them is the, um, it's, uh, I think it's the pensioner, uh, statements or newsletter that is going out in a few months. We've got a notification in there. We're also going to send something around in the uh, employer newsletter and that will go out to all employers and we'll ask them to pass that on to everybody. Um, I appreciate we may miss some of the deferreds, but unfortunately I don't think there is a perfect way of catching everybody this year without doing a mail shot. And as I said earlier, as well as the significant expense, which will probably be about 15, 20 grand. We'd also have to, you know, print out thousands and thousands of copies and mail these all out. So at the minute, that's the, the best way we figure to do it is that we'll put it out through those streams, get people to register if they have an interest and do it that way. The following year, we can capture everybody in the annual benefits statement. 
Uh, Sean, I could add that uh, the, the trade unions have got their own sort of uh, membership databases and uh, I would sure I, I would be sure confident that they would uh, be uh, happy to render any assistance on that by actually sending out messages to to their to the to their members uh, on the, their options for engagement in this. That, that'd be that'd be brilliant. Thank you, Andy. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll be in touch with them when we get a bit closer to that because that'd be really useful. Thanks. Yeah, as Sean said there. Thank Andy. you. As Sean said there, Andy, next month we're writing to um, the 15,000 pensioners with their annual P60s and pension increase letters. So we'll be putting some information in there for them and we can put obviously put information in the active and deferred member benefit statements. Thank you. Okay. Sorry, Derek, you're on mute. When the member's self-service that is up and running, um, can you be able to add something to that so that um, after an email notification they can reply on that platform? Uh, there's a newsletter area, um, Chair, where we can put information for members, um, which would prompt them to look at the website. Um, I don't think there's actually a way to communicate via email. Okay, just wondering how to make things easier for you. Okay, thank you, thank you for that. Sure. Uh, yeah, unless there's any further questions, Derek, I, I'm finished on this agenda item. Thank you. OK, page 71, we got two recommendations, both on notes, notings on move from the chair that this is approved. Have a seconder, please. Happy to second. That's Joanna. Thank you, chair, Joanna. If it's just for noting, I'm not sure that we actually need a formal vote. I mean, if it's just purely to note, oh, um, need to be yeah, corrected. But if it's just for information, if this does vary from committee to committee, you know, Joanna, something at uh, Marina, something at um, Democratic Services might want to look at. OK, so we don't need to do that. It's just noting. In that case, we move on to um, Matt, who is um, going to take us on page 107 um, to the administration update. Matt is standing in for Calvin. Thank you for being here, Matt. No problem. Thank you, Chair. Um, just a usual update from administration, although I should highlight that there is a second recommendation this time um, regarding the exit cap decision that was made in the December meeting uh, following the uh, removal of that, uh, those regulations. So starting with the employers in the fund, um, only a few uh, changes. BIFA um, have changed just within the company, so BIFA Environmental left on the 31st of January and BIFA Municipal joined, but it was only an internal company change and they asked for administering the waste contract. There was two very small TP transfers catering staff as well out to external companies in January. Uh, moving to the external membership, uh, the active membership uh, movements, the July to September figures have actually been requoted because last meeting we hadn't had the new starter information from the cloud. We've now got that uh, information from the Oracle system and we've updated those figures. That's actually moved the membership uh, number changes to a positive number of posts again in that quarter because it was shown as negative previously. While we're on the subject of the Oracle Cloud system, um, we will obviously be using that system for the year end this year for the first time and we are aware that the um, development for the extract extraction of data has been left a bit late. So there is a risk that I need to bring to the committee just about um, being able to ensure that we get that data from the employers that are paid on that system by the deadline of the 30th of April. We will hopefully have an update earlier in April to see how that's going, but uh, it's just really to say that at the moment there's about 30 employers paid on there and there is a possibility that that information will be late and it will put us under pressure for getting the statements out by the end of August again. We understand that, Matt. It's always a risk. We realise that. Okay. Uh, next, on to the administration workload. As you can see there, we're back up to the normal numbers that we uh, achieve in the quarter. And the number of outstanding tasks is staying about the same uh, as they were for the last quarter. Next, the communications. We've got the three employer newsletters uh, attached in the appendices that have gone out in the last quarter. The 
anything unusual, unusual in there either. And the death grants again are around the same sort of number and the same sort of value. Risk register, as I've mentioned earlier, we've um, removed exit, the exit cap risk at AC12 following the removal of the regulations uh, in February. We then have the pensions increase exercise. So every year in April, we have to increase the value of the pensions that are in payment. When we do that, we send the pensioners a letter to confirm the value of their new pension. We send them a P60 and we send them a newsletter. It's quite a large exercise. Um, it's writing to around 15,000 people. Uh, I'm pleased to say that we've started to look at this already on the Oracle cloud system, and this part of the cloud is actually working very well, and the um, initial tests that we've done look very good. Uh, finally, from me, member self-service. Um, I know this has been a standing item for a long time, but I'm actually pleased to say that it is <laughs> finally moving forward. The uh, training in February did have to get cancelled last minute due to some problems with um, access to the systems, but they're now resolved. We've had the first training this week, the whole team. We're very impressed with the initial views of it. It actually does a lot more than we thought it would do, and we can see it being a real benefit to the team. That's really good news. And can we sell it to the government so they can sort out their, their database? <laughs> yeah, Which sure. is, uh, they're about 10 years behind us. Yeah, I mean, as we've said, I think Calvin said for about the last 12 months, um, when we are able, we will bring the demo to the uh, committee and show you what it can do. That'd be good. Thank you very much. Any questions for Matt? Just, just one statement. This is um, on the back about death grants. I just want to remind the committee what happens when there's a death grant and there, there's no expression of wish on file. Then Calvin gets to me. He gives me details, not financial details, just the broad details, and we agree them with each other. And that's how the death grant is applied. I'm only saying that because there has been an external query in the last three months from uh, people. So, and after those details come to me, I delete them from the system permanently. So that's a double delete. So they only remain with the uh, pensions admin system. Um, that, any other questions? Yeah, question from Andy, uh, Chair, please. Andy? Yeah, just to say um, the uh, progress on the exit cap, that's su such good news. I think it was the trade unions took the government to court over this, but um, I think the, the government backed down before the court hearing. It's just the, the anguish and energy involved in getting the government to U-turn on this is just so regrettable, so bad. It was the pensions department of the local government association put huge pressure on the government as well. Good. Yeah. Yeah, any other, no other questions in that case? Thank you very much. Um, Rowena, because it's got this exit cap thing in it, I would like to actually have a recorded vote on this, if you don't mind, uh, a normal vote. Okay, no, that's fine. So I'm going to move the recommendations on page 107 with yeah. the, the first normal noting and then the, the information about the uh, um, revocation of the exit payment regulations. And I'll move that from the chair. Can someone second it, please? I'll second it happily. Thank you. Was that Pete, was it? Okay. Andy, Andy stopped, I think. Okay. That. <laughs> Thank okay. you. Um, I'll do a roll call vote. Councillor Holly. Four. Councillor Mitchell. Four. Councillor Fitter still isn't here. Councillor Harris. Four. Councillor Hurd. Four. Councillor James. Four. Councillor Kenny. Four. Councillor Kirkham isn't here. Councillor Monk. Four. Councillor Wood. Four. Andy Stott. Four. Thank you. That's unanimous, Chairman. Thank you very much. Thank you for that. And we move to page 125, where Sean was going to Tell us how wonderfully we've governed, Sean. Thanks, Derek. Yeah, I'll just quickly run through the report. And then, as I said earlier, I'll hand over to Catherine to give a, a verbal update on the good governance review, which um, unfortunately there was nothing published in time for these papers. So there'll be a more detailed report at the next meeting. So if I could just turn everybody to page 130, which is just the overview. The only change to the risk register is that one of the risks was removed, which is the one around the exit cap, which Matt has just gone through. Um, 
there are no further changes. I don't know if anyone has any questions on that before I just run through the rest of the updates. No. Um, so the pension board update. Um, unfortunately, the minutes for the previous meeting won't yet be available on the web link because we only held the meeting last Thursday. However, these will be on um, as soon as they've been processed. I, I think one of the key items that was discussed, which we'll touch upon later, is the review of the pension regulator code of practice and how the funds complying with that. But we'll touch upon that later. The other update for the pension board is that one of the members who's been on there for a few years, Nigel Carr, has now stepped down. So in terms of the membership, last year we actually extended the membership from um, five to seven. So we feel like we've got sufficient redundancy at the minute and we'll soon be starting a recruitment process to fill um, the vacant spot. Still on page 30 is the external audit plan delay. So that was, as I covered earlier, um, due to COVID related reasons as a backlog, and we're not expecting that until the end of April, start of May. Um, and the final one I wanted to cover is just the Competitions and Markets Authority. Um, you may remember that uh, about a year and a half ago, the committee set some strategic objectives for MRSA which was something which the Competitions and Market Authority said we had to do. So as officers, we've reviewed MRSA against these objectives that the committee sent and we returned a positive confirmation to the Competitions and Market Authority that MRSA were performing in line with these objectives. So that's just for the committee to know that there's no further action there. Um, if there are no questions on those bits that I've just covered, then I'll hand over to Catherine. No, Catherine. Um, thank you. Um, yep, just to give a quick update on the good governance um, project. So, the um, over the last year, um, hampered a little bit by 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 COVID and and the fact that um, many of the stakeholders had to had to prioritise other um, in fact response to the pandemic. Um, the the project did bring the final report to the scheme advisory board on the eighth of, of February. The final report really focused on um, the implementation of the proposals that, that were agreed. The phase two proposals were, were had previously been agreed. So phase three was really focusing on the detail of some of the implementation. So there was nothing nothing new in the report, nothing that um, you, you won't have seen before, but um, some exploration of what the, the LGPS senior officer role meant and, and, and where, um, where that might end up. Also, um, some more elaboration on the, the KPIs for um, administration and, and governance oversight of, of that administration. Um, and finally, some detail on really what is um, the, the document for, for, for demonstrating the good governance that the, that the funds have in place. So the enhanced governance compliance statement. So um, that has been, I suppose, beefed up a bit to so that we can um, we can evidence all the, the areas that, that, that were covered in the review. In terms of timeline for it, um, the, the Scheme Advisory Board has approved it and the Chair of the Scheme Advisory Board, and so Councillor um, Phillips, has written to MHCLG asking them, um, or basically performing the role of the Scheme Advisory Board in, in ad advising MHCLG that they think they should bring forward guidance to make those, those recommendations um, it, to take effect. MHCLG um, have a lot on their plate just now um, and so it's not entirely clear what the timeline will be because it's now dependent on MHCLG drafting that guidance and then obviously bringing that guidance out to a formal consultation. Um, I think the hope is though that that will happen over the course of the next year and that, that the kind of new regime will be in place for um, not this financial year but the next financial year so that we're aiming to have that in place from kind of 1st of April 2022 and to be reported on um, at, at the end of that year. Um, as Sean said earlier, just to, to, to relate this to your own, your own situation, I don't think there's, there's much in it that will have a drastic impact on, on what you do. So I was just listening earlier on, one of the recommendations in it was, was to ensure that, this, that, that the committee has, a, has appropriate oversight of the amount of resource needed to deliver the regulatory requirements in administration. Um, and that was evidenced beautifully earlier when we, we talked about the business plan and the, the additional resources that would be 
needed um, to, to deliver McLeod. So that, that it's that it's that kind of thing that the that the, um, that the the good governance project was really looking to 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 see in evidence. So I think that's a really good example of where where you're already meeting the standards. Um, so as I say, I think there might be a, a wee bit of work to do in in, in in making sure that those are all transparent and and available for people to to, to review. So that that's the main the main gist of it. I'm happy to take any questions on it. Um, so what sort of report, Catherine, is coming next time for the, next, for the June meeting, July meeting? Um, I think we'd have to ask Sean. I don't know, Sean, if you wanted to bring some some more detail on some of the recommendations that, and, and maybe some of the maybe start to think about where the gaps might be and some of the work that you might need to do to get to that point. That probably seemed like the next step. Yeah, that's exactly what I was going to say, Catherine. Thank you. Yeah, so we'll just talk the, the committee through um, where we'll be going with that and, you know, our timescales for the work plan and putting it all in place and just a bit of a gap analysis, really. I got it. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Any questions? There's one more question there. Who's that? Joanna. Just sort of making the comment there that, of course, what you'll be dealing with next time, I believe, it will be after the election. So you will actually probably be, it doesn't even matter if we're all elected. It doesn't mean to say that we're all going to come back to the pensions committee, apart from Derek, of course, who's a complete masochist. Mm -hmm. um, so I think you'll be looking at that committee to do a, a total new approach not get into the too sophisticated stuff that um, where the rest of us are familiar with it. I think it's going to be going to be a, a, a challenge. <laughs> you can say that again. Absolutely. To comment on that, that was one of the themes of the report was this ability to deliver really good governance against the, the backdrop of that changing membership of committee. And so it, it does it does look at that and talk about um, training plans and and how we can how we can maintain those and evidence those really good standards of governance against that backdrop. So a really salient point there. Yeah, and the only thing I'd like to add, Derek, is that there was quite a comprehensive training plan detailed in the business plan um, and comments around this. Yeah, there was. Thank you for that. Any other questions? Was that your hand still up, Joanna? Yes, Joanna, Mr. Chair. Okay, in that case, that's fine. Uh, Catherine, thank you very much for that, and thanks for the work you're doing in, on our behalf. And, and of course, on the behalf of other LGPSs as well, your firm, isn't it? Yes, uh, thank you for that. Um, I'm just going to note that, so we'll have to vote on that on page 125. Note the government update and request, government update and requests such clarifications and further information from officers as may be requested. We'll see this in July. Um, I, I can number eight, I've got no other urgent business. The one we were going to have was the net zero investment. Excuse, um, excuse me, Chair. Is this a good time to take a break, Derek? We... Yeah, hang on. Yes, yeah, I'm just going to say, finish this part Sorry. of it. Yeah, no, it's quite right. Uh, so I've got no other business. And before we move into part two, it's time we took a break. Thank you, Peter, for that. And so it's now 11.07. So if we have... Chairman, no. would you like to just take the vote on the exclusion of press and public? Because we will be stopping the live stream at that point. So if we take the vote in public, that then we can stop the live stream and yeah. have the break at the same time. Yes, indeed. Um, uh, item nine, which is uh, committees asked to consider a resolution to let press and public be excluded from the meeting for the business specified in the following items on the grounds that there is likely to be a disclosure to the public of exempt information of the following descriptions, i.e. information relating to the financial or business, business affairs of any particular person, including the authority. And therefore, we are, uh, we are showing compliance. Um, I'll move that from the chair. Could I have a seconder, please? Happy to second. That's Joanna. Thank you, Joanna. Verena? OK, I'll do a roll call vote. Councillor Holly? For. Councillor Mitchell? For. Councillor Harris? For. Councillor Hurd? For. Councillor James? For. Councillor Kenny? For. Councillor Monk? Councillor Monk. For. Councillor Wood. Councillor Wood. Okay, Captain Andy Stott. For. That's carried, Chairman. Um, we'll just wait for confirmation that the live stream has stopped. Thank you.